welcome to today's webinar, Taxation of buy to -let Properties, Are You Ready? Uh, my name is Chris Springett. I'm a partner here at Smith & Williamson in the private client team. Uh, I'm also part of our real estate group, so regularly advise landlords on the tax rules around property in general, uh, and more recently, particularly around their buy to let businesses. Um, just a slight disclaimer there, but looking at what we'll cover today, so we'll be re recapping on some of the recent changes in, in the buy-to-let and, and property worlds. Uh, we'll also be discussing what action landlords are taking to, to mitigate the impact of these changes, looking at some case studies. Uh, also, we'll be running through how Smith & Williamson might be able to help landlords and the sort of work we, we, we are doing. Um, so background-wise, uh, you get a real sense of the direction of travel over the past few years when you plot the changes that have taken place in the taxation of, of residential property. You end up seeing two real aims coming through with this legislation. Firstly, you see taxation being used to influence behaviour, with the government looking to discourage landlords through the tax system. Uh, you also get to see the government wanted to, to share in the upside of the prop property market through a widening of the tax base, um, be that extended capital gains tax or ensuring inheritance ex taxes applied to UK residential property or the stamp duty changes. Uh, we're really now starting to see these changes bite. Uh, they've been trialled, they've been starting to be introduced, uh, but as I say, we're, we're really starting to see these impact landlords now, uh, hence the, the idea of, of recapping on some of these changes to, to show how they're influencing. So mentioning the, the two aims, so that of, of um, the behavioural taxation and the widening of the tax base, um, we see regular changes taking place to the tax system around property in general, but particularly residential property. And what we've got here is a, is a timeline that really tracks these changes. So right back in 2013 was when we really started and we saw the introduction, introduction of ATED. So this annual tax on envelope dwellings seeks to pre prevent perceived stamp duty land tax and inheritance tax avoidance on residential property uh, through the use of corporate structures. And it does that by imposing an annual charge on these types of structures. In December 14, we then see a change in stamp duty land tax, or, or SDLT, with the slab system replacing the progressive system. Fast forward to April 15, and we saw the extension of capital gains tax, or, or CGT, to non-residents owning UK residential property. Swiftly followed in uh, April 2016 by an SDLT surcharge uh, on second or additional properties, and later that same month, an effective 8% capital gains tax surcharge on residential properties. From April 17 to the following year, restrictions on income tax relief for financing on, on buy-to-let properties was introduced. Uh, that's what the main focus of today will be on. But that's not the end of it. So um, 31 January 2019, i.e. the January just gone, is the payment date for the 2017-18 tax liabilities. So landlords may still be reeling somewhat from the increased liabilities that flowed from these changes. Uh, and finally, looking to the future, we've got the acceleration of capital gains tax reporting and payments to 30 days from uh, sale from next April. Um, Currently, you can have over a year to, to make the payments, but that's going to change from April 2020. So let's drill down further into some of these changes. So firstly, stamp duty. So as I'm sure you're all aware, SDLT being the tax payable on acquisition of a property. So we have the 3% SDLT surcharge introduced for completions on or after 1st of April 2016. So this applies where at the end of the day of acquisition, the purchaser has an interest in more than one dwelling. While exemptions exist for replacement of the main home, for example, um, we can see the impact of these changes through a, through a quick example. So um, a £250,000 buy to let sees stamp duty land tax increase from 2500 
before 1st of April 2016 to £10,000 post uh, April 2016, a real impact on that initial outlay. As I say, likely to apply to most buy to uh, and most of the time uh, when we're looking at company acquisitions, it's going to apply in those situations as well. So a real impact for a landlord and a real need to recoup some of this buy to let, uh, some of this outlay when the when the actual buy to let starts. Um, secondly, capital gains tax. Uh, so being a tax payable when you sell your property for a profit. Um, previously, uh, capital gains tax always had a territorial limitation, i.e. it was only ever charged to people resident for tax purposes in the UK. But that has now been expanded from 6th of April 2015. Um, anyone anywhere in the world owning UK residential properties falls within the UK capital gains tax net. It's quite big changes and, and a real widening of the tax base. People have up to 30 days to report and, and, pay, and, pay, and pay the tax due. So quite an onerous regime, a limited amount of time to pull together the information needed to, to report this gain. Effective surcharge on capital gains tax for residential properties also introduced. So the capital gains tax rate in general was decreased in April 2016 by 8%, but residential properties were excluded from this. And based on commentary that, and, and comments that landlords have made, people see this as quite a big concern as the asset, i.e. the property, really needs to increase in value uh, to make up for this higher tax rate than, say, an investment portfolio where the capital gains tax would only be 20%. And then, as mentioned, finally, from next April, a 30-day reporting window will be extended to cover disposal of all residential property, regardless of the residence of the seller. So again, big changes and people will need to be really on the ball to, to report the disposal on their, for example, buy to let properties. So all, all these are changes really impacting buy to let landlords and the commerciality of, of their business enterprises. However, as I mentioned, the main focus of today is around restrictions on mortgage relief. So prior to April 2017, landlords received marginal tax relief on mortgage interest that they pay in respect of their buy-to-let business. So what does that mean? Well, effectively, the interest that was paid was a deductible cost in calculating the profit of the rental business. So every pound of interest that you paid, you got a pound of deduction in your accounts. However, from April 2017, it, we've seen a phased restriction on that relief with the current straight line deduction being replaced by a basic rate credit. It shows on the slide that the restriction will be phased in over a four year period. However, all this is really doing is adding a degree of complexity alongside the tax impact that these changes are having. So what changes may we see? Well, we potentially now see landlords no longer paying tax on the economic profit of their business, but a deemed profit. Therefore, your after-tax returns could now be zero or even lower than zero. You may need to fund a tax bill out of other income in order to keep your property business going. That really impacts the viability for many of the property business. However, the impact's not just limited to your rental computation, so it's not just limited to how you calculate your, your rental profits. As the landlord's income increases under the new regime, we could see other income sources taxable at higher rates. We could see restrictions on the amounts that can be put into a pension, could impact the loss of the personal allowance, and the need to pay higher income child benefit charges. All these factors are dependent on, on the taxpayer's income for tax purposes, and it's that likely to be higher under these changes because of the way that the credit is now given. So on the slide is an example of the impact and it shows that not just large portfolios are, are, are affected. Uh, in this example, you see that the landlord goes from being a basic rate taxpayer to being a high rate taxpayer, which results in a 12% increase in their effective rate of tax. And this 12% increase happens even though 
the rental business hasn't changed. Rents have stayed the same in that period, but the tax rate has increased dramatically. So what action might a landlord consider? Uh, three categories here, which we'll explore with a few examples of what people are looking at. So the first one is they might do nothing. The second one is they might take some action, but retain that their ownership around it. And the third one that we're seeing quite, quite often now, or at least having discussions on quite often, is the idea of restructuring in and incorporating the property business. So let's look at some case studies. So do nothing is, is very much, much an option. Um, particularly sort of discussions we've been having here is where the income from the property business isn't actually the main aim behind the portfolio. So the example here is where people are thinking of, of property for its as a, as a capital asset, so the capital growth uh, is, is actually the key. Um, so in those cases, the, the landlord may be happy to accept that the, the income tax burden increases, um, the, prop, the income tax yield, uh, the income yield isn't as good as it was previously, but the asset class, i.e. property, residential property, is something they still want to be actively involved in. So they might accept the tax changes and actually do nothing. And that's many of the conclusions we've reached have been around that. But that might not be an option for all. As I said, because we're not paying tax on the economic profit anymore, it may be that the business is no longer viable in its current, current state. As such, what action have people been taking? Well, paying down or restructuring the debt might be a way of dealing with this. If you can bring the debt down to a certain level, you might not be in that position where the, where the um, tax burden exceeds the ultimate profit from the business. Um, you may also look at ensuring that the rental profit is actually taxed on somebody where the impact might not be as great. So, for example, allocating the, the rental business or, or the rental profit to a non-earning spouse who's already a basic rate, or who's only a basic rate taxpayer, may mean that the basic rate credit that is given on the mortgage interest relief is actually sufficient uh, and the impact is not as great. However, we've seen a lot of people where that is insufficient. Those sort of, for want of a better word, easier options aren't necessarily going to obtain what they want to do. So we've looked at a third course of action, which is around restructuring the portfolio into a company, i.e. incorporating the business. So why might one consider a company? Uh, on the slide, there's, there's some of the key advantages which we'll run through. Firstly, net profits from the property de development role or the rental business are liable to corporation tax at 17% instead of income tax at up to 45%. So already you've got a, 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 a good reason as to why a company might be a suitable vehicle for this. Uh, on transferring the properties to a company, there's a capital, capital gains tax based cost, based cost uplift to the current market value of the properties. So if the company were to sell the properties, the gain might actually not be as high as if the individual were to sell the properties. Also, chargeable gains on future disposals will be taxed at 17%, not the 28% that we've mentioned that individuals buy, uh, pay. So again, uh, a tax saving through using the corporate vehicle. The individual is only taxed on the amounts extracted from the company and then at their marginal rate. So there's a degree of control over when the income tax liabilities can be paid. So we've got an idea of, of extracting via dividends, via salary, and controlling when the tax liabilities arise on that individual. Wider planning then around company pension schemes and making pension contributions on the behalf of the, the directors. That might be a tax efficient way of extracting cash from the company and also thinking about longer term planning flows further into inheritance tax planning and, and estate planning, getting the next generation involved in the property business. Much easier to gift on shares than it is parts of properties, particularly in a larger property portfolio. So again, using the company can be a, a good way of, of achieving this wider family business planning. 
And finally, the, the key one, and the one why well, we're probably talking about this, there's no suggestions that the proposed restriction for tax relief on mortgage interest will be extended to companies. So the company can claim the mortgage interest relief as a deduction in its profit and loss account for the rental business. So we've touched on the positives, not going to be suitable for all, and I think that's one of the, the key things also to think about. There are some potential disadvantages around incorporation. Existing finance arrangements, likely that they'll need to be changed or at least considered um, by, to let, uh, by to let borrowing for companies. There's a lot more in the market now. Uh, but at the same time, it, it is likely that discussions will need to be had with, with existing um, lenders. We talked about extracting from the company, but remember that does result in a potential double layer of taxation on extraction. So the company pays its tax, albeit at that lower rate of 17%, but it's still paying tax. If the landlord then needs to extract all that profit out, they're going to pay tax again on that extraction. T tax is likely to be not saved in those circumstances. So again, if the income's required to, to fund living costs, if all of that income is required, then this might not be a, a suitable vehicle for that. Also, you don't pay rental income on a, on a rental business in your, sorry, you don't pay national insurance on a rental business in your own name, but if you start taking a salary out of a company that is running a rental business, national insurance would need to be considered. So that's both on the individual and also on the, the company. Now, we might be able to mitigate that in some ways through use of dividends to extract profit, uh, but again, it depends on specific circumstances, so that needs consideration as well. A lot of people talk about loans out of their business as a way of, of um, extracting value, but that brings with it a lot of adverse tax implications and consequences, both again for the, for the individual and for the company itself. So real care needed if you're looking to make loans to the, to the shareholders and, and to the directors. Uh, we touched on the annual tax on envelope dwellings. Although the charge shouldn't actually arise, uh, ATED looks at really taxing properties where, where the owners of the companies are living in those properties. So we're not really concerned about the charge, but we're likely to have filing obligations under the ATED rules, if only to claim the relief that's available. And really the big one that where the, the, the issues arise is on the actual incorporation itself. We might have capital gains tax and we might have stamp duty land tax uh, arising when we transfer the properties from our name into the company. Uh, and I think it's worth spending a bit of time on, on those charges just so people can, uh, can understand the sort of decision making that's needed. So firstly, capital gains tax. So why is it an issue? So you transfer the property business to a company and that actually triggers a disposal for capital gains tax purposes. So you're looking at proceeds being equal to the current market value of the properties, less your original cost. So if your properties are all standing at a, a capital gain, i.e. the current market value is higher than the original cost, then you might have a capital gains tax charge when you transfer across, and that will be what we refer to as a dry tax charge, i.e. you don't actually have the cash to pay that CGT, so it can put you in a difficult position. So what might the solution be? Well, this, there is a relief called incorporation relief. So this applies when you transfer a business as a going concern to a company in exchange for shares in that company, i.e. you transfer the properties into the, into the company and it, rather than cash, you, you get the shares in the company. And it results in the existing gains on the property being rolled into the shares in the company, i.e. your gain that would otherwise crystallize is deferred until such time as you sell the shares in the company. So pushing that tax charge, avoiding that dry tax charge. There are conditions, obviously, for the relief to apply. So you've got to transfer the whole assets to the business, excluding cash, but otherwise the whole assets to the business are transferred to the company. So what you can't do is pick and choose the properties in your property business that you want to transfer. You'd have to transfer them all. 
you've got to transfer it as a going concern, i.e. the assets transferred to the new company must be used in the same type of business as the business they were using prior to the transfer. So you can't suddenly start property developing from your buy-to-let business. And it must put the new co in a position to operate as a business. Um, we'll come on to a bit more detail about what business means after, but you can see we've got to be transferring that business across. And you've got to receive, the fi final condition is you've got to receive uh, wholly or partly shares in the new company. Should be easy to achieve because this is what we're looking to do. We're looking to replace your direct ownership with ownership through a company. So really, it's that, it's that second condition that we need to look at in a bit more detail. This idea of, well, where, when does your rental business constitute a business for tax purposes? So we've uh, listed up on the slide there some of the, the key things that at least HMRC consider. So their guidance talks about incorporation relief being resisted uh, on the transfer of a passive holding of investments or an investment property. So this idea that if you're simply in it because you like the asset class and you're not really running a business, then, they, then incorporation relief won't be due. Um, there was a case a few years ago, the Ramsey case, which is the, the leading case around here, that widened that slightly or at least gave, gave us some support for arguing that the, the rental business can uh, qualify um, by saying that business is not synonymous with trade. Uh, it's, it's a wider definition, which, which is good news, uh, but factors we may need to consider. It needs to, uh, they're all listed on the slide, but the, the general thinking around it is that it needs to be this idea of you operating as a, rent, as a business. You, know, you need to be seriously pursuing this in order to make a profit. You need to be um, organized in your accounting, organized in the way that you, you run the, the property portfolio. You need to see real substance in terms of turnover. You need to be regularly doing what it would be expected of a property business. There's a, in, in the guidance, HMRC also talk about 20 hours a week being spent on the activities uh, for those activities to constitute a business. Now, as I say, that, that actually stems from the Ramsey case, which is what the person in that case was spending on the business. So. That kind of gives us a, a, a green light if we're doing, if we can prove we're doing more than 20 hours. Doesn't hurt us completely if we're doing less than 20 hours, but you just need to be really mindful of the fact that HMRC could challenge, and it's how far you'd want to take that. One of the recent changes, I suppose, is that HMRC have now stated they won't give clearances on this matter. So when the rules were first introduced and we were looking at this for clients, we could write to HMRC to ask them to, to confirm that the activities that were being undertaken, undertaken did constitute a business for these purposes. HMRC are now saying that as that's a matter of fact rather than a matter of law, they no longer give clearances, which unfortunately can lead to or does lead to some uncertainty in, in some circumstances. But what do, do we need and, and what sort of things should we be thinking about? Again, listed on the slide, but w w where might we go there? So we're talking about negotiations. So are you leading the negotiations? Is, is it part of your role to, to talk to the tenants and, and to agree the services that are being provided? Are you advertising and vetting those tenants? Are you managing the wider business? So are you managing the property finances? Are you preparing the accounts or at least a, a cash flow for the business? Are you involved in the repairs and the renewals? So are you getting involved in the day-to-day? -day? Now that's not saying are you doing those repairs and renewals, but, but uh, you know, is it you organizing those? Are you looking at development of the properties? Are you trying to improve the business by making the properties more marketable, uh, improving the rental yield on them through developing them? And as I say, at the end, are you producing the annual accounts? Are you keeping the finances in order? So as I say, key activities there. Um, so we've discussed capital gains tax. I also mentioned a, a stamp duty land tax risk on incorporation. So there's an SDLT charge on the market value of the properties transferred to the company. Again, potentially a dry tax charge 
nobody actually purchasing the properties, but, but the transfer across is enough to trigger this, this SDLT charge on that market value. Um, solutions, well, two really that, that we see. The first is multiple dwellings relief. Um, so that this averages the consideration across the number of dwellings uh, in order to determine the rate of tax. Um, it can be very helpful when we're looking at portfolios and, uh, and moving those across, but it does set a, a de minimis of 1% of the consideration. So even under uh, MDR, you're still going to have a, a dry tax charge. A second area where partnerships are incorporating, uh, quite a complex set of rules, but can be very beneficial, so definitely worth exploring. Um, so effectively, if you're currently in partnership as part of your property business, and then the ultimate owners of the company are effectively the same partners, then the rules state that you've not effectively changed your partner's interest. Uh, which can mean that the uh, SDLT is nil uh, under, as I say, quite a complex set of calculations. As I say, very attractive if, if you follow within the rules. Have to be very careful around the anti avoidance provisions for stamp duty land tax. You can't just artificially take any steps to put you into a partnership that then leads to a company. Has to be some real substance to to the partnership initially. So again, great care required and, and advice would definitely be sought if you're looking at, at that route. So how can we help? Well, in conclusion, from next week, we'll start to see a 75% restriction on mortgage interest relief. Uh, as such, if you've not already done so, then landlords should consider how their business might be impacted uh, and what action they, they should take. Um, we're happy to speak to landlords uh, to discuss the impact and then any questions that, that might need to be considered uh, as part of that, you know, be it the do nothing, be it the, the slight changes to the business, be it the, the bigger incorporation. Um, as I say, we're, we're here to help and we're happy to, to have the discussions uh, as appropriate. Um, I've got time for a few questions if there is any. I've seen one come through uh, which basically says, uh, is there anything else to come? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, yes. Um, although, that being said, most of the changes that are still to come are, are around the capital gains tax position, um, not too much around income tax and the, and the property business. Um, so on the capital gains tax, so from next week, we've got capital gains tax extended to non-residents selling UK commercial property. Um, so those thinking of perhaps expanding the, the business from residential to commercial should be wary of that. Uh, as I've mentioned, we've also got the 30-day reporting and payment on all UK, UK property uh, from April 2020. Some uh, consultation on private residence relief uh, was released this week. Um, the, well, you might not think that's relevant, uh, relevant to, to buy to let, but actually uh, it's about the curtailing of the availability of lettings relief. Uh, as such, landlords letting former homes are likely to see an increase in capital, gain, capital gains tax on sale under these proposed changes, so just something to be mindful of there. Um, and then longer term from there, uh, also, an ongoing consultation around a further 1% SDLT surcharge for non-resident purchases, so uh, more SDLT uh, lo looking to be taken. Uh, interesting to see how those discussions develop. Uh, and you look at, I suppose, given political uncertainty, looking at the, the various parties' manifestos, uh, a lot of them talk about increases in, in property taxes in general. Um, again, around revenue raising and freeing up the housing market. Um, no real specifics at this stage about what that might mean, but as I say, unfortunately, I think it's an area that will continue to develop. So very much worth uh, keeping, keeping an ear to the ground on this if it is a, an asset class in which you're involved. Um, I can't see any other questions, but uh, contact details are, are all there. Please feel free if there's anything else to, to get in contact with us. Uh, more than happy to have initial discussions about where we may be able to help. Many thanks for your time.